So Lord, would you put our hearts in that place today of saying that our whole lives are yours. We hold nothing back from you. There, there's no area, there's no place, there's no arena of our lives that we keep separate from you. It's all yours. We take our lives and we lay them at your feet. And so today, would you speak to us? Would you speak to us into maybe the places in our hearts that we've kept from you? Would you speak to us into maybe even the sensitive areas of our lives, Lord? But would these moments in your presence change us deeply and radically, Lord? So we ask that your will, we surrender our will, and we ask that your will be done in our lives today, Lord. This time is yours. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Were you glad to be in church this morning? Good, me too. Turn around and say hello to somebody and then you can grab a seat. While you are being seated, I want to say hello to everybody who is watching online. Thank you so much for joining us. And I also want to say hello to all the guys on our Lansing campus. Good morning, guys. Good to see you. Glad that you're with us. Um, wow, well, it's already been just like an incredible time this weekend. Anybody make it out to Family Fun and Fireworks? This, yeah. I'm not gonna lie to you, it was cold. Um, but man, what a great time. Michelle and I had such a great time uh, meeting new families, connecting with people, uh, having the opportunity just to say hello. And, uh, and it was just a, a, such a fun time. So really grateful. You know, we're dedicated as a church to uh, creating unique experiences for families in faith-filled environments. Uh, and so that was what, a part of what that night was all about. And, the, and then just a real opportunity for invitation to say, um, invite people to join us and, and to be with us. And so just a really, really great night. And you know, so many of those things that we do, not just events like that, but all of our ministries that happen throughout the week happen because of your generosity and because of your faithfulness. And I try to bring you stories of those every week, but sometimes what I, I miss in that is giving you the, the stories of what God is doing in people's lives because of their giving. Uh, and so I wanna share one of those stories with you today. So if you would, would you take a look at this? My name's Isaac, and this is my wife, Sam, and uh, we get the honor of speaking to you, with you a little bit about our, uh, the blessings that we've received by being involved uh, with the many ministries that are here at Vineyard Church. And one thing since we started attending this church in 2019 that we've really been impressed with is the heart for, of the church and the people in the church for those that aren't a part in the community around us. And we get great blessings out of being a small part of how that affects the community and the body of believers. We've been impressed how Vineyard has doubled in size since we first started attending. And while there might be a new face to greet and say hello to every morning, there has always been an opportunity to connect with others from connect class on the weekends, from the different outreach like prison ministry and foster care ministry that or small group there has always been a way that the church has extended the hands of Jesus to reach into the lives of others. It's one of the reasons why we believe tithing has been so important to our family is to continue to provide these opportunities for the church to continue to reach out. Whether it be in the prison ministry where we get to let people know that they're a child of God and that they are still a human and that the community loves them, whether or not it's getting to help provide food for a kid uh, so the kids don't go hungry, or whether or not it's uh, just getting uh, to turn the lights on and get to come together and worship as a family, every part of that we get to uh, have a little sense of joy that we were a part of helping uh, that all come, come to be. And the blessings that you can receive from just getting to know that you're a small part of it has been I mean, uh, inspiration of our family and just vital to the growth of us as Christians and we believe uh, to the growth of the church. So we are extremely excited to continue to be a part of it and we look forward to you joining us. 
grateful to them for uh, sharing their story today. And I just want to say thank you to all of you who help us facilitate the things that God continues to ask us to do here and allow us to say yes. And we'll put the ways that you can give up on the screens today. Kiosks are in the back of the room if you came prepared to give in person. But I want to thank you for investing your time, your talent, and your treasure. Uh, we also have our vision offering coming up here in just a few weeks, and that's an opportunity for us to all come together uh, on one day to say we're going to give above our tithes and just ask God to use that as a catalyst to continue to propel the vision of this house forward. Um, and I want to tell you that also tonight there is a Calling All Creatives event, so a way for you to you be able to use your gifts that you can, if you, if you sing, if you play an instrument, if you are an artist in some way, a great time for you to come together and collaborate to see uh, how God can use your talents here uh, for the kingdom. And so we're excited about that. All right. Are you, let me just maybe say this before. I, I, I just I want to just say, you know, the scripture says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And then the psalm says, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. And I will say, this is the declaration, that today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. That is demonstrative. It is enthusiastic and it is exciting. So it's basically saying, when I come to church, I will not just sit and silently stare at the man who talks in the front, but I will with enthusiasm say, I, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So with that being said, are you ready to get into the word today? Oh God. Won't he do it? We are in week six of a series that we're calling Fields and Thrones, and what we're, looking is, we're doing is looking at two Old Testament kings, David and Saul. Saul sits on the throne, but David has been anointed as the one who will eventually sit on the throne. I did have someone ask me this week, I get the thrones, where's the fields? So let me just say, uh, when they were anointing people as king, at looking for a king in Jesse's house, David was in the field. When David fought Goliath, he was... In the field, you're with me. Okay, so um, this week, last week we talked about how Jonathan and David had made a vow of friendship to one another. Jonathan has this terrible interaction with his father Saul and realizes that Saul truly wants David dead. So Jonathan goes to David, renews his vow of friendship with him, and then tells David, you have to run. You have to get out of here. My, my dad's trying to kill you. So David runs out into the wilderness, out into the fields. But Saul goes on the hunt for David and has spies looking for him. And in this season of David being on the run and Saul on the hunt for him, I want to look at two interactions that happen between David and Saul. The first one we're going to look at today is in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 2, where it says this, So Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. At the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. Of all the caves and all the places, Saul chooses this one to go and relieve himself in. And doesn't this seem like the perfect opportunity for David to end all of his problems? Not, not only will Saul be gone, the person who's trying to hunt him down, the person who's trying to kill him, but David is also anointed to become the next king. And so if he can get rid of Saul, things change for him. When else is he going to find the opportunity where Saul is alone to deal with this? And David's men see this opportunity too. Verse four, now is your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today, the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. So not only are David's men saying, this is your opportunity. They're even saying, no, look, the Lord did this. He put him in this place. The Lord's giving you this opportunity. It's time to take him out. And David creeps forward and he cuts the hem off of Saul's robe. But as David begins to back away, he doesn't even like that. Look at what happens in David's conscience in verse 5. But then David's conscience began to bother him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this to my lord the king. 
I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. After Saul had left the cave and gone on his way, David came out and shouted after him, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. Then he shouted to Saul, Why do you listen to people who say I'm trying to harm you? This very day you can see with your own eyes it isn't true, for the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave. Some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you, for I, I said I will never harm the king. He's the Lord's anointed one. Look at my father, at what I have in my hand. It is a piece of the hem of your robe. I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I am not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you have been hunting for me to kill me. So David spares Saul and tells him, I'll never harm you. You're the king. You're the God's anointed. I cut off the hem of your robe, but I didn't kill you. I had the chance, but I didn't. And would you believe that David gets another opportunity like this? Because Saul doesn't stop. He keeps pursuing David. And one night, David hears that Saul and his men have camped near where they are. And he sneaks into the camp. This is 1 Samuel chapter 26 and verse 5. David slipped over to Saul's camp one night to look around. And Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of his army, were sleeping in a ring formed by the slumbering warriors. Who will volunteer to go in there with me? David asked Ahimelech the Hittite, and Abishai, son of Zeruai, Joab's brother. I'll go with you, Abishai replied. So David and Abishai went right into Saul's camp and found him asleep, with his spear stuck in the ground beside his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying asleep around him. God surely has handed your enemy over to you this time, Abishai whispered to David. Let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't need to strike twice. The men are all asleep, and they're, they're sleeping in a circle. Saul is in the middle. He's supposed to be safe, surrounded by all of his men in the middle. And he's got a spear stuck in the ground next to his head. This is the way that they did this. It's a safety measure so that if there was an attack in the night, you can quickly grab your spear, and you'd be ready to get on the attack. And somehow David and Abishai make their way all the way through this circle of men, all the way to the center, and they find Saul with a spear sticking next to his head. And Abishai says, now's the time. We've got our shot. Let me do it. I won't have to strike twice. And what Abishai is doing is bragging a little bit. He's saying, you know, I'm a professional at this. I can kill a man with one strike and silence him. You say, not everybody can do what I can do here. Some people might mess this up, but, but I know how to do this and we'll be out of here. So how does David respond? Verse 9, no, David said, don't kill him. For who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? This is the same language that David used in the cave, the, the Lord's anointed one. The anointed ones were people who God anointed with his presence in the Old Testament. He appointed prophets, he anointed priests, he anointed kings, and they were supposed to save people and serve people. And because of that, the anointing gave them a special dignity. What David is saying is Saul deserves to die. He's not worthy just in and himself, but as the Lord's anointed... As someone that the Lord has touched, he has to be treated with sacred dignity, and I won't lay a hand on him. David is being hunted by Saul, and he does this incredibly noble thing, and we can say, well, good for him. What does that have to do with us? Well, a lot. And here's the reason why. Because you and I are surrounded by many people, people who we can see and we can hear their words, we can see their actions and we can see their attitudes and they don't deserve good treatment. But because they've been touched by God, they do. Genesis chapter one, verse 27 says this, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. It is perfectly clear from the Bible is that human beings, all human beings, 
made in the image of God, reflect God in such a way that they must be protected. Every human being has a sacred dignity about them. Now, look, I know none of us are hiding in caves and sneaking into camps with an opportunity to take out our enemies. So what does this mean for us? It means guarding our words, and guarding our hearts and guarding our actions, the way that we talk about other people. James 4.11 says, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job, this is strong, is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. And look, the fact is we're all like David, surrounded by Saul's, people who don't act like, in many cases, people who probably deserve less than great treatment. But because of the image of God, we must treat them as God treats them, which is infinitely precious and worthy of absolute dignity because of who they are, God's creation. When you look at somebody next to you who maybe doesn't deserve great treatment, you have to ask yourself, yeah, but what does the Lord deserve? What do I mean, what does the Lord deserve? Because the person that you're sitting next to is the image of God. So give the person the treatment that God deserves because God made this person. Would you want to give the, per like the way that you're treating people, would you want to give someone who is the image of God that way? Like, that's amazing. So what does the Lord deserve from you? That's what you owe everybody around you. The most uninteresting, the most unlikable. Let me say it to you this way. The weight of the people in our lives and the glory of the image of God that they've got should weigh on us. David looked at somebody who deserved something else and at great risk to himself, treated him with sacred dignity. We're supposed to do that to everybody around us. And I know, look, this is easy to do to people that you like. It's easy to do this to people that you care about, but how do we do this with an enemy? How do we do this with somebody who seems to be on the opposite side to us? David shows us how. David says, Lord, however this ends up, I put it into your hands. Let's go back to the camp. Verse 10, surely the Lord will strike Saul down someday or he'll die of old age or in battle. The Lord forbid that I should kill the one he has anointed, but take his spear and that jug of water beside his head and let's get out of here. Now, those are three very different outcomes. Think about it. He's saying, well, God, he, this guy's so wicked, he could strike him down dead right here. Bam. Or maybe he'll die at an old age. Or maybe he will die in battle. Those are three incredibly different outcomes. The point is, only God knows what he deserves, and only God has the right to give it to him. Let me say it again. Only God has the wisdom to know what a person deserves so we can never try to give people what we think they deserve. Why? You don't know what that person's been through. You don't know the motives of anybody's heart. You don't know what their background is. You don't know what they deserve. You don't know if they should be struck down or whether they should mercifully be allowed to live the rest of their lives. You don't know. So not only does God alone have the wisdom to know what a person deserves, only he has the right to give them what they deserve. It's a great theme of the Bible because you and I only live by God's mercy. We are only alive because of God's mercy, so it would be absolutely unjust to withhold mercy from anybody else. Let, let me just poke at this a little bit more. None of us live like we should. None of us live God with, love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, with all of our minds, and nobody loves their neighbor like they love themselves. None of us. So if God created us, it means God has given us everything, and he sustains us every second of every day, and so we owe him everything. And if we don't do that, then we fall short. So if you and I are alive today, it's only because of God's forgiveness and mercy. And if you and I live strictly by God's forgiveness and by God's mercy, then to withhold forgiveness 
and to withhold mercy to anybody is absolutely unfair. Jesus sometimes makes these statements when he's teaching that are like, that one is hard. (laughs) Mark 11, 25. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Why do you have to let go of a grudge? Because it is completely unjust for you not to. Let, Let me just keep pushing a little bit. David, by forgiving Saul and not taking vengeance on Saul, has made sure that he's not going to become Saul. If David had killed Saul in vengeance, if David just let his anger go and let himself get to a place where he was just as self-pitying, just as self-absorbed, just as self-righteous, and therefore just as capable as the cruelty that Saul was showing, by, by be, he would become Saul and then If he would have gotten rid of Saul, just another Saul would have ended up on the throne. Can I read you another tough verse? I mean, I'm going to anyway. I just, I'm not really asking. (laughs) Romans 13, 1. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Mm -mm 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 Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. That one's ouchy, isn't it? All authority has been given by God. Now, I want to be clear today, not, pe- not everyone in positions of authority use those positions correctly. But we've gotten to a place where we value our opinions, our thoughts, our ideas, our preferences, and our styles far more than anyone else's, and it's made us willing to undermine and to slander authority to try and get what we want. We always think that we think that we should be in charge. And this verse that we just read says all authority is given by God, but we are in a rush to get to positions of authority, but we don't ever want to honor authority. Do you ever think that God asks questions like when he sees us saying, my boss is so terrible, and we go around the office telling everybody how terrible our boss is, talking about, if I was in that spot, I would, God, you just need to get rid of him, Lord, because I would do such a better job than them. Put me in that spot. God, my teacher doesn't know anything. They're the worst. They don't even know what they're doing. I mean, I don't really want to go there, but boy, that pastor sure has changed a lot of things around that place. (laughs) I don't like them. See, we see, we all, we like our voice. And we always think that we should be in these positions of power. Do you ever think that God is just looking at us like, how can I put you in a position that you don't honor? How can I move you into a position of authority when you can't honor authority in your life? Like, so you want me, so you don't have any respect or desire to submit to authority, and yet you want me to put you in a position of authority? Well, that's hard for us to wrap our heads around, but we just like our opinions so much. David is anointed for this position but it's currently filled. And he's saying, Lord, it's in your hands. He hasn't been good to me. I think I could do a better job, but that's your job. And I will serve and honor the authority that you have placed in my life until you make something change. And the last part of this even if they aren't good to me. Because I won't let their behavior create sin in me. I won't slander. I won't gossip. I won't undermine. I will honor you first, Lord, and I will honor your authority until you have placed me in the place of my life. And in your timing and in your way, I will trust you to do what you're gonna do. So I will forgive the grudges in my heart so it doesn't tempt me to become resentful. It's getting quiet in here. And 
I want you to look at the way that David talks to Saul. Verse 12, so David took the spear and the jug of water that were near Saul's head, and then he and Abishai got away without anyone seeing them or waking up because the Lord had put Saul's men into a deep sleep. And David climbed the hill opposite of the camp until he was a safe distance, and then he shouted down to the soldiers and to Abner, the son of Ner, wake up, Abner. Who is it? Abner demanded. Well, Abner, you're a great man, aren't you? David taunted. Where in all of Israel is there anyone as mighty? So why haven't you guarded the master of your king when someone came to kill him? This isn't good at all. I swear by the Lord that you and your men deserve to die because you failed to protect your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around. Where's the king's spear and the jug of water that beside, beside his head? And Saul recognized David's voice and called out, Is that you, my son David? And David replied, Yes, my lord, the king. Why are you chasing me? What have I done? What is my crime? David is talking to Saul and he says, my Lord, the king. You know, he doesn't say, you dirty, bitter old man. <laughs> Do you know what he's done? He doesn't even say, I forgive you, you bitter old man. What he's actually doing because it's very clear, right? The reason he's not killing Saul, the reason he's not letting other people kill Saul is because in his heart he's forgiven. He doesn't think ill of him. He thinks respectfully of him, my Lord, my King. And this is doing something in the heart of Saul. It's causing discomfort to Saul because that's what forgiveness does. Here's how. When you do this, it hurts. Every single time you do it, it hurts. Every time you refrain from bringing it up to them just to make them feel bad. Every time you stop yourself from talking bad about people to other people. Every time you prevent your thoughts from just running away with resentment, it hurts. Do you know why? Because you're paying the debt instead of the other person paying the debt, and that is what forgiveness is. If you lend somebody your car and they wreck it, there's only two things that can happen. Either that, either that person says, or you say, I forgive you, don't worry about it, in which case you pay for it, or they pay for it. And you'll, you'll pay for it, either with insurance premiums that get higher or not having a car. But in other words, when someone really wrongs you, sometimes we can forgive people for things that don't really bother us that much. We can be like, oh, that's not that big a deal. It was only 10 bucks. But the point is, like, in those situations, we don't really feel it. But when someone really wrongs us, there are only two things that you can do. You can make them pay. You either punish them by going to them and making them feel badly, or you punish them by talking badly about them and tearing down their reputation, or you punish them in your heart by being resentful. Of course, you're paying the debt. You're absorbing the debt, and that's the reason why forgiveness is so hard. David risked his life. Abishai says, today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. And Abishai must have been looking at David and saying, if you don't take this opportunity, man, you're missing it. This is it. Why? Because this, this guy could kill every one of us. If you don't kill him, you're putting us all at risk. And David was actually paying a very big price, an enormous risk to himself, making himself incredibly vulnerable. But forgiveness is always costly. You either make them pay or you pay in some way. And some of you might be sitting there today saying, like, this is interesting, but it sounds like you're saying that the person just gets away with it. You mean you don't go talk to them? No. No, listen carefully. I said you don't go to them in order to punish them, but it doesn't mean that you don't go to them. Look at Saul's words here as we jump down to verse 21. Then Saul confessed, I have sinned. Come back home, my son, and I will no longer harm you for you, you valued my life today. I have been a fool and very, very wrong. Saul is a fool. He calls himself a fool in our language, we look at fool and we think, you jerk, you idiot, you fool. But in the Bible, it has a very specific meaning. It means 
to willfully and destructively be blind to your own faults. So when you're dealing with a person like that, not somebody who wrecks your car and they feel really badly about it. That's not what we're talking about. You're talking about a person who's pretty bad and willfully and destructively blind to their own faults. And you say, well, how can they be willfully blind? That is called denial. You know, but you don't know. And there are people who have not only done bad things to you, but they keep doing bad things. So what do we do? We see here, how does David love Saul? He doesn't just simply forgive him and go away. He takes the spear. He goes to a place that's safe, away from assault, but close enough to where he can hear him. And he calls down, and the first person who answers is Abner. Saul hears and wakes up and says, David says, look, I was down there. And I could have killed you. Here's proof. The spear. And Saul's heart is touched. And his conscience bothers him. David, my son, I've been a fool. What's going on? David is being realistically and aggressively loving. He's not being passive. Forgiveness doesn't mean being passive. He's going after Saul, but not going after him vindictively. He's not trying to make Saul pay. He's already given up that possibility. He's going after the hardness of the heart of Saul. It's possible to continue to hate in response to love, but it's hard. And David is saying, look, Saul, I I valued you. I valued your life. And Saul starts to melt. What most people do is not what David did. What most people do when we're wronged is we either say nothing on the outside, but in the inside, we just let it boil over, and then we just let it out. Or we go and talk to the person, but we do it to punish them and to make them feel bad and to rehash the past. Basically, we're trying to punish them. We're trying to make them feel as badly as they made us feel, and David does neither. David forgives Saul from the heart, and when he confronts Saul, he's not trying to make him feel bad. He's trying to reclaim relationship with him. So we're supposed to forgive people who wronged us, but we're also supposed to love them. We're supposed to forgive them, but because we love them and to love a person, we can't just let them keep sinning. It's never loving to let people keep sinning. It's the worst thing for them. Becoming awful and evil. So David responds, verse 22, Here is your spear, O king, David replied. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord gives his own reward for doing good and for being loyal, and I refuse to kill you, even when the Lord placed you in my power, for you are the Lord's anointed one. Now may the Lord value my life, even if I have valued yours today. May he rescue me from my troubles. And Saul said to David, Blessings on you, my son David. You will do many heroic deeds, and you will surely succeed. Then David went away, and Saul returned home. Notice he's realistic. Saul says, come down, David. And David goes, no, no, send somebody up to get that spear. Do you know why he doesn't trust Saul? And he's right not to trust him because Saul doesn't stick to repentance. Say he he doesn't forgive them, then then he doesn't trust him. No. To, To forgive is to love somebody. And to trust somebody who's going to wrong you again isn't loving. Like to let somebody sin against you isn't right. To to forgive someone and then to trust them naively isn't loving. It's not the best thing for them and it's not the best thing for you. But when you confront someone after you've forgiven them and you're not confronting them for your sake, you're confronting them for their sake and for the sake of other people that they might wrong. I can tell you this, if you confront somebody out of love and not with the slightest desire to make them feel bad, but just to simply show them what's wrong, If you confront somebody out of love, they may not change. But I can tell you this, if you confront somebody out of vindictiveness, they'll never change. They will see you retaliating, and they'll retaliate back. And it will just go on and on. The only hope we have in this world is if we know how to love fools is to realistically and and aggressively love people and to confront them out of only love. So the question is, how in the world will we ever get the power to do this? 
How do we do it? The way you love your neighbor, the way you love an enemy, the way you love a fool is by learning to love God's anointed and to see how he loved. And you can say, well, I thought God's anointed was Saul. Well, yeah, Saul's a bad example of God's anointed, but when God anoints somebody, that person is anointed to save and to serve people. He anointed prophets and priests, a king, a judge. Someone in the Old Testament, when he anoints someone, he anoints them to save and to serve his people. And Saul only used his position to serve himself. Well, I, I want to close today. I just want to show you something powerful in Scripture as I was studying this out today. In our very first week, we talked about how Saul uh, lost the favor of God in his disobedience. And, and I just want you to see what happens in this interaction between the prophet Samuel and Saul when Samuel tells him that he's lost God's favor. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 26. But Samuel replied, I will not go back with you since you have rejected the Lord's command. He has rejected you as the king of Israel. And as Samuel turned to go, Saul tried to hold him back and tore the hem of his robe. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and given it to someone else who is better than you. And then, in the cave, when David is sneaking up to Saul, what does he do? 1 Samuel 24, verse 4, Now is your opportunity. David's men whispered to him, Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. The symbolism of David taking the hem. Do you see it? David's showing himself to be a true anointed one because what David is doing is David is not using his position in order to serve himself. David was struck and he didn't strike back. David gives himself and commits himself to God. And at the end he says, the Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me. And in the New Testament, the hem of a garment is mentioned again. When a broken, alienated woman cast away from society said to herself in Matthew 9, 21, for she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. If I can just touch the hem of his garment. And she did. She touched the hem of who? Jesus, the ultimate anointed one. By the word Messiah, that word in the language means anointed one. Jesus, the ultimate anointed one, like David was driven into the wilderness and had no place to lay his head. And then he was struck and he was reviled, but he didn't strike back. When they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. David risked his life in order to forgive Saul and to reclaim relationship with him, but Jesus lost his life in order to forgive us and to reclaim us. And on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, and he forgives his enemies, and in the very end, he says, into your hands, I commit my spirit. A price had to be paid on the cross, and Jesus paid that infinite price. And if you believe that you are a sinner saved by grace, then it gives you the humility that you need to forgive. Let me just say this to you today. You can never forgive somebody that you feel superior to. Mark my words, if you're having trouble forgiving anybody right now in your life, use this little test in your life. You can't forgive somebody if you feel superior to them. And you might say, well, I never do anything like that, but I can just tell you that when you start to feel that way, the gospel comes in and begins to touch your heart because you are a sinner, you are lost, and apart from Jesus and his salvation, there is no hope for you. And so the gospel humbles you down to a place where you cannot feel superior to anyone. It lets you know that I am a sinner in need of the saving grace of Jesus, and so is everybody else. And so I cannot think of myself as superior. I cannot think of myself as better because I am just as in need of his grace as everybody else. The other thing that the gospel does is that affirms you because why are you upset? Why do you need to forgive somebody because they harmed your reputation? Because they took something from you? 
because you've lost some wealth, can I just tell you that your greatest reward is waiting for you in heaven where your reputation is pristine, where your wealth is waiting for you. And when you realize that the love of Jesus has created something that can never be taken away from you, then you're not reliant on what other people say and how they treat you to find your worth and value. It's found in the gospel. And so you can't feel superior. You can't feel better. We all need the grace of Jesus. We're all in that place. And when you get to that place, it's easier to honor authority because you know that he placed them there. And when you get to that place, it's easier to trust God's way and to trust his time. Think about this in your heart right now. If there's any person that I'm failing to love, any enemy that I'm failing to love, any fool that I'm failing to love, any neighbor that I'm failing to love, Look at your heart and say, they need the same grace that I need. Use the gospel in your life and let it change you into a place where you trust God to do what he's going to do. You trust the way that he's going to work more than you trust you. Let him work in your heart. Can we pray that for ourselves today? Lord, the cry and the prayer of our heart today is that you would allow us to see the world through the lens of the gospel. That all of us are human beings intrinsically valuable because we're made in your image. And your love for us has made the playing field even. We are sinners in need of a savior, in need of saving grace. And so is everyone around us. And so today, Lord, would we trust in your timing? Would we trust in your authority? Would we trust, Lord, that that vengeance is yours and not ours? And could we look at the world and look at people through a lens of love? We stand in gratitude today because you love us. You care for us. You see the good in us. And you loved us so much that you were willing to sacrifice. Your word says that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. And so today, could our posture and our attitude be one that says, if you can forgive me, then I can forgive others. If you can trust me to stand in this position in my life, then I can trust that you're putting people in the right spots. My hope and my trust is in you, Lord. Let me be moved to that place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. There's a sense that uh, I have in my heart today of that there are people that are coming to our minds that we are holding bitterness and resentment in our hearts towards. There is uh, authority that we have in our life that, like the truth is we've slandered, we've talked poorly about. And I I just wanna, let me just make this statement to you today and I wanna give us time to pray. It is hard to be mad at somebody that you're praying for. And so what if we just took the posture of our hearts today and just said, I'm gonna pray for those people today. I'm gonna pray for the people who wronged me. I'm gonna pray for the people who I have bitterness against in my heart. And Lord, I'm gonna let forgiveness heal me because your forgiveness has healed me. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm gonna ask our prayer teams to come forward and to be available. And if you would say, look, I need someone to partner with me in prayer, someone to believe with me. Allow one of these people to pray with you today and to believe with you. I'll come back in just a moment and close our service out with a blessing, but would you just take the next couple of moments, be respectful to the Holy Spirit and allow him to speak to your heart.
moments like this where I just stop and reflect on how grateful I am that the Lord has loved me the way that he has. That he loves me despite the mistakes that I make. That he loves me when I don't get it right. That he forgives me when I do things that dishonor him. who would I be if I couldn't extend that same thing to other people? Are you grateful for the love of Jesus today? Mm -mm -mm. He is so good. He is so, so good. Thank you for being here today. We're so grateful for you. Grateful for the opportunity to worship, to learn, to grow together. I pray that you're leaving stirred and encouraged and challenged today, that the Lord is speaking to your heart. Lots of opportunities for you to get plugged in and involved. We have Calling All Creatives tonight. Great way for you to lean in. I challenge you to be a part of that. We'll put the ways that you can give up on the screens. Kiosks are in the back of the room, um, but I'll get you out of here today. If you would, posture yourself to receive the blessing. So Father, would you bless them and keep them? Would you make your face shine down upon them? Would you be gracious to them? Turn your countenance their direction and give them peace. In the almighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. We love you, we believe in you, and we'll fight for you. Go love somebody today.